This summer we are revisiting the Psalms of Ascent, which are, it's a 15 week sermon series that I preached here at Grace over the course of five years. I told you last week that I have looked at these Psalms dozens and dozens of times and they never get old. And I am sure it will be the same for you. There are always new things to learn and to see. Our contexts change. Um, we come to the text differently. So I'm confident that as we make our three month trek through these Psalms again, you will find new things. This morning's psalm is the second in the collection, Psalm 121. And it's about help, but specifically about helpful help. Now, you know that not all help is created equal, right? For many years, when I would go home to visit my parents, they would greet me at the door or shortly thereafter with their list of computer woes. They each had a computer and a printer. You know where this, you know where this went, don't you? <laughs> um, I usually, I think I'm on? Okay. I usually um, created more problems than I fixed, and that's just the way it went. It required real help that I could not give. If you've ever had a toddler help you, you know that not all help is created equal. Help comes in varying shapes and sizes and actual helpfulness. Psalm 121 is about help, but help that is actually helpful. I hope that as you consider it with me this morning, you will better understand places that you and I often turn for help that isn't actually helpful. Let's pray before we get started. Almighty God, we long to see you this morning in your word. We long to hear from you to learn from you. Open our eyes so that we can see and our ears so we can hear and turn our hearts to what you have to say. Amen. Before we dive into the text itself, let's do a quick review of what these Psalms of Ascent are, what this collection of Psalms may have been used for. People think that they may have been used by Israelites who were making a pilgrimage to the Jerusalem temple three times a year for those feasts that we talked about earlier in the spring. Or they may have been used by diaspora Jews, that is Jews who were scattered among the nations after the exile to Babylon began and ended and they just stayed where they were. But they looked forward to a day when they could return to Jerusalem and worship with God's people at the temple. They looked forward to that future restoration. Either way, these are songs for pilgrims and for disciples. They're songs for people who were living in a daily life that as it worked itself out, it wasn't quite the way life was supposed to be, the way that God intended life to be. But they were journeying to a world, to a place where all things would be made right again, where all would be well, where there would be shalom and peace and thriving for everybody. And we're going to say this a lot this summer, but that's us. We are pilgrims and we are disciples living in a world that isn't exactly the way it was meant to be. And sometimes it looks worse than other times. And sometimes we encounter situations that take us by surprise at how bad they are. <laughs> like, wait! But we live in a fallen world. And it surprises us with its harshness, with its difficulty. But we are journeying to a place and a time when all will be made right. When all will be made new again. We are on this trip of a lifetime. So with all this in mind, let's take a look at Psalm 121. Now this is a familiar psalm to many of you, I know, um, but this morning I'm actually going to use a slightly different translation than one you may know, that you may have memorized, because I really want to highlight a couple things in it that sometimes get lost, or you might overlook them. So in your bulletins, you should have found a yellow piece of paper like this that has the translation that I'm going to be using this morning. Let me read it for us. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from Yahweh, the one who made heaven and earth. May he not let your foot stumble. May he not slumber, the one watching over you. Yes, he does not slumber. He does not sleep, the one who watches over Israel. Yahweh is the one watching over you. Yahweh is your shade at your right hand. By day, the sun will not strike you, nor the moon by night. 
Yahweh will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. Yahweh will watch over your going out and your coming in from now until forever. This is the word of the Lord. Now, if you listened carefully, or if you look at your handout carefully, you can see and hear different voices in this psalm. It starts with the voice of the psalmist, who says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? But then when you get to verse 3, you hear a different voice. May he, meaning Yahweh, not let your foot stumble. May he not slumber, the one watching over you. So the voice expressing what is really like a prayer on the psalmist's behalf. May Yahweh do this for you. And then I think we may actually even hear a third voice when we get to verses 4 through 8. And it's a voice that assures us that this prayer will be answered. Why are there multiple voices? Why is there an I and a your and a he? Why are all these voices speaking in this psalm? In the psalm we looked at last week, which was Psalm 120, we heard only the psalmist voice, his single voice as he wailed about the difficulties and the distresses of his life in a foreign land and his need for Yahweh to deliver him. He was alone, and his journey had just started. I think when we turn the page of what's an ancient hymnal, the book of Psalms, I think we hear the voice of fellow travelers join this psalmist as he's making his trip. It's encouraging the psalmist, assuring him, helping him to hold fast to the truth when life stinks, because sometimes it does. Let's look at all these different voices a little more closely, starting with verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help is from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. Now let me ask you, why is the psalmist looking up to the hills? Why would you look to hills or mountains? Maybe you think they're beautiful. The scenery is spectacular. You just look and admire them. Maybe you're dreaming of a ski trip or hiking. Well, I can guarantee you that the psalmist is not having any of your thoughts uh, when he lifts his eyes to the hills. Why the psalmist is lifting his eyes to the hills actually depends in part on which hills he's looking at. We We have a couple choices. The first hills mountains that he might be looking at are those between him and Jerusalem, between where he is and his destination, the route that he's on. There are mountains in the way. And in this case, if that's what he's looking at, he sees danger. Uh, Mountains, in ancient Israel at least, were sparsely populated. They were desolate regions where wild animals hung out and some pretty wild, unsavory people hung out there too just ready to relieve you of what you might have in your pockets. If you're lucky, you'd get away with your life. The mountains were a place that made people vulnerable. So if that's the case, and that's what the psalmist is thinking, I lift my eyes to that scary place that I have to go before I can get to my destination. And where is my help going to come from? A second possibility of what the, why the psalmist is lifting his, mount, his eyes to the mountains or which mountains he's looking at is that he's thinking about the hills that surround Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is elevated a little bit. Mount Zion, it's where the temple is. It's his destination. It's where God's dwelling place was. And we hear about these mountains specifically in other psalms of ascent. We hear about those who trust in Yahweh are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. That's in Psalm 125. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so Yahweh surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. So the psalmist, in this case, lifts his eyes to the hills, and it's the place where his help will come from. The psalmist might have actually both of these in his mind, He will have to journey through difficult terrain to get to Jerusalem. And yet, that destination is surrounded by mountains, which are reminders of Yahweh's protection. We are on a journey, and it's a difficult one. And we, like the psalmist, need help. Where is that help going to come from? 
Well, the psalmist doesn't leave us in suspense. He asks the questions from, where is my help going to come from? And then he answers it immediately. My help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. The Old Testament often refers to Yahweh, to God, as the maker of heaven and earth because it's a way to talk about his universal sovereignty and his great power. Heaven and earth is one of those figures of speech that we've talked about before that means everything. Um, this is the God who created everything. Uh, if you think of our expression, I looked high and low for something, what do you mean? You just looked high and then you just looked low? You looked everywhere, high, low, everywhere in between. So for the psalmist to say that God is the maker of heaven and earth, he means everything, heaven, earth, everything in between. But notice that the psalmist doesn't use the name or the title God. He uses the covenant name of Israel's God, Yahweh. Now you can tell this in your Bibles um, and you can tell it in my translation because I actually used Yahweh. But in any Bible you pick up, you will find LORD in all capital letters, L-O-R-D. And that's how English translations signify the name Yahweh. He is the universal God. Israel's God, specific to this little nation, is the God of the universe. He's not just a territorial God. He is the maker of heaven and earth. And the psalmist acknowledges that he is part of Yahweh's covenant. This is the God who promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all their descendants that he would take care of them. He would be their God. So when the psalmist says, my help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth, he has a legitimate expectation that God, Yahweh, is going to help him because that's what he promised to do. So the psalmist expresses his need for help, and he acknowledges that Yahweh is the one to help him. And then we get to that second voice in the psalms, in the psalm. Verse 3, may he not let your foot stumble. May he not slumber, the one watching over you. This second voice is responding to the psalmist's declaration and offers what's really a prayer on behalf of the psalmist. And I think the second person, as I said before, is a traveler, a fellow traveler with this group going to Jerusalem in this community, these, this group of pilgrims on their way to worship there. And this fellow traveler has heard this cry of the psalmist, where's my help going to come from? And his assertion that it's going to come from Yahweh. And he then turns it into a prayer for his friend. May Yahweh not let your foot stumble. May he not slumber. Have you ever had someone hear you, hear your concerns, and turn it into a prayer on your behalf? Uh, Max did that for me this morning as the elder who prayed with me before the sermon. He heard some of my concerns, and he turned it into a prayer. I was part of a church in Washington State that had a Stephen ministry. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, the, that's a program that trains lay people to simply walk alongside somebody in a difficult situation and pray for them. They're not a counselor, they're not a therapist, they're a friend who hears and prays. I had a Stephen minister in that church because I needed help, and I often told her, I need help. I know who God is, and I know he can help. I didn't know how he was going to help, but he knew he could. And she heard me, and she prayed for me. She turned my cries for help into prayers for God's help. We need each other to do that for us, don't we? Sometimes we don't have the words. We know the Spirit intercedes for us when we have no words, but we need our friends to do that too. Specifically, what does this friend in Psalm 121 pray? Two things. First, he says, may he, meaning Yahweh, not let your foot stumble. Now, there are a number of things that can make us stumble or totter or sway or trip. Fatigue? Anybody tired? In more ways than just you didn't get enough sleep last night? Have you ever been so tired you could barely put one foot in front of the other? 
Sometimes we stumble or totter or sway for lack of attention. Have you ever been talking to someone next to you and you tripped over something right in front of you? You just didn't see it. Sometimes we stumble or trip or stagger or sway because of a rough path. Uh, we were on one of those this week with Rick's family. Uh, the kids wanted to go cliff, cliff jumping somewhere, and they assured us we'd have this nice, easy hike around the lake to get there, but it really was not. It was full of rocks, and, and I and my brother-in-law, who's a little younger than I, really wanted to turn back, but we could not because our mother-in-law, who's 83, was trucking on ahead. <laughs> there was no way on God's green earth, or in that case, God's very brown earth, that we were going to turn around and go back. There were rocks everywhere. There were plenty of opportunities to trip and stumble and sway. We couldn't have missed everything. We all tripped. Sometimes we stumble. Sometimes we're so tired of life that we stumble a little bit in our faith. Sometimes we're so distracted by other things that we don't pay as much attention as we should to what God says. Sometimes we stumble in our Christian walk. Are we stumbling back there a little bit? <laughs> it happens, I know. Sometimes there's so many things going wrong or going on that we can't possibly keep tabs on all of them. We stumble. This friend prays, may Yahweh not let your foot stumble. The second thing the friend prays is that Yahweh wouldn't slumber. Now, if you know the story in the Bible of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, you know that ancient Near Eastern gods were not always on high alert. Uh, sometimes they rested by sleeping. Uh, in the story of Elijah, the prophet of God calls on the prophets of Baal. He mocks them. He says, hey, where's your God? Come on, guys, wake him up. And those prophets are gashing themselves, and they're crying out. There's 400 of them. That's a lot of noise. Wake up your God. Maybe he's sleeping. <laughs> and when Elijah called out to his God, what happened? <laughs> Israel's God, the God of heaven and earth, does not slumber. He does not sleep. Sometimes it might seem like God is sleeping. Have you ever prayed and prayed? and prayed and prayed for something and you didn't see an answer? It seemed like maybe those prayers bounced off the clouds? Have you ever wondered how a particular tragedy could happen? I could list off some tragedies, whether they're personal or national or international. You've got your own fill in the blank. How did God let happen? Where was God? Did he forget? Did he look away? Did he not hear me? We are not the first people to wonder such things. We may not always voice them, but we're not the first to wonder them. The Israelites wondered it too. Psalm 35. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Psalm 44. Awake! Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Wake up and do something, God. The friend of the psalmist in Psalm 121 prays that Yahweh would be visibly active in his help. He prays that Yahweh's watchfulness would be evident. Yahweh is the one who watches over, guards, and keeps Israel. Watchfulness. Watch over. That is all over this psalm. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to give you this, because you can see it. You can see the word watch. Um, the Hebrew word for this is shamar. And it shows up six times in this psalm, starting in this verse. Six times. May the one who watches over you not slumber. When we move into the next section of the psalm, we hear affirmations and promises that respond to this prayer. Yes, he does not slumber, nor does he sleep, the one who watches over Israel. Now, if you look this up in your Bible, this verse, you might find the word behold, where I've used the word yes. Behold is a fantastic old word. If you grew up on the King James, you probably still use it sometimes just for fun. Behold, 
It's a great old word that often announces something new, but it can also be an affirmation, a yes or indeed. The friend over here has just prayed that Yahweh wouldn't slumber. And here we get this resounding affirmation to drive the dark of doubt away. Yahweh sleep? Uh-uh. Never doesn't happen. He does not sleep. He does not slumber. This God is never drowsy, never dozes off. He's not distracted. And unlike some of you here this morning, he never nods off. Although you actually look pretty good this morning. I'll give you that. The God who watches over Israel is also the one who watches over you. He is on high alert, watching over you and me all the time. Yahweh watches over you. Yahweh is your shade at your right hand. By day, the sun will not strike you, nor the moon by night. Notice that verses 5 and 6 are not a statement about the future. Yahweh will watch over you. What's happening right now? He is your keeper. He is actively watching over you. He is your shade at your right hand. Uh, as I said, we were in Arizona this week, and Rick's family loves the sun, and I don't so much, and my dermatologist, that he, he's happy about that. So we were forever, we spent the week looking for shade. His family spent the week in the pool. <laughs> We're looking for the shade. Because in a tropical climate, like Arizona or like the Middle East, Israel, shade is life-giving protection from the blazing sun. In the Bible, shade or shadow can also apply to being cared for and protected in someone's house. You live under the shadow of their roof. Shade provides a shelter from what could harm. Yahweh is your shade at your right hand. Now, I'm left-handed, so I would say Yahweh is the shade at my left hand. What does that mean? He is right there all the time, that close. He is your shelter by day and by night. Day and night, that's another one of those heaven and earth all the time. 24-7, around the clock. And then this psalm crescendos with this statement about what Yahweh will do. These are promises for the future. And they're promises for the psalmist, but they're also for us. What are they? What are these promises? Yahweh will watch over you. Or he will guard you, is how most translations uh, do that watch over from all harm. He will watch over your life. He will watch over your going out and your coming in. There's another one of those. Everything in between. From now until forever. Uh, let me ask a really hard question here. Does Yahweh, in fact, keep bad things from happening to us? It's kind of what that sounds like, right? He will watch over you or guard you from all harm. Does he really do that? Uh, if you've spent any time at all in the Psalms, you know that bad things happen to people all the time. If you've spent any time in your own life, you know that bad things happen to people all the time. How can the Psalm offer this promise on God's behalf? Well, first of all, this is not a promise that hard things will not happen to you. We live in a fallen world. And sometimes life just stinks. We need to recalibrate how we think about harm in this world where God is sovereign. God does allow painful things to happen, but he can and he does use those things for our greater good and for his glory. Um, in a book that I've read on the Psalms, Psalms of Ascent, uh, the author has a particularly helpful illustration on this, this verse. Uh, this is Josh Moody, Journey to Joy. So let me just read a paragraph from here. And he's asking the question, what does it mean that Yahweh will keep you from all harm? He says, think of the surgeon prepping himself to go into surgery. As he prepares, he knows in one sense that he is about to do his patient harm. He's going to cut open the body and delve in with surgical tools. The patient is going to bleed. 
If there were no anesthetic, the patient would be screaming in pain, strapped to the operating bed. That sounds evil. Yet that surgeon rightly believes that he is following the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. Harm is not harm when good it does. Sometimes the things that cause us pain are for our healing as broken people. Sometimes the things that cause us pain are for our growth, polishing a rough edge. Sometimes the things that cause us pain are the result of God's discipline. Have you ever disciplined a child and known it was going to hurt them? Why'd you do it? Because you knew it had to be done. There will be painful things in our lives, but if we cling to God, we will not face anything that is finally and truly evil. Yahweh, the psalm promises, will keep you from all harm from now until forever. That's 24-7, 365 coverage forever. It's continual. Yahweh does not sleep. It's comprehensive. The sun's not going to hurt you. The moon's not going to hurt you. In all of your goings out, coming in, covered. This is not a trite promise about just trust God and he will make your life go well. Don't trust God for that. <laughs> you will be sorely disappointed if you are expecting an easy path. Pilgrims on this road can expect hardship, suffering, even persecution. Jesus makes that clear, and Paul backs it up. So what is the comfort of this psalm? Remember where we started? I lift up my eyes to the hills. Those hills could be the difficulties and dangers along the path. They could be the mountains surrounding Jerusalem, so reminders of God's protection. But what I didn't tell you about those hills is that they were also the place in the ancient Near East where the gods lived. Israel's idolatrous neighbors worshipped their gods at high places in the mountains. They made sacrifices to their gods in the hopes of gaining and keeping that God's favor. The gods made the rain fall, the sun shine, and their crops grow. They depended on the gods for their livelihood, for their lives. The psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills, that place where the gods live, from where does my help come? Which of the gods of the hills is going to help me? We lift our eyes to the hills all the time. And we ask, which god is going to help me? Which god is going to comfort me when I'm disappointed? Maybe I need some shopping therapy. Maybe I need some chocolate therapy maybe drugs, maybe alcohol. Which God is going to protect me, comfort me when I'm disappointed? Which God is going to satisfy my loneliness? If I just had the right relationship, if I just had kids who would take care of me, if I just had... Which God is going to satisfy your loneliness? Which God is going to make me happy? If I just had a little more money, if I had a little more success, I just need to have a little more fun and then I'll be happy. Any of those gods, and a whole lot more, offers help. But it's always temporary. And ultimately, it's unhelpful. Where can we find real and lasting help? We're on a difficult journey. We lift our eyes to the hills all the time, and we ask, where does my help come from? Which God is going to help me? Where should I turn? The answer, my help comes from Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. He is the God. None of those other gods can help. And if you've accepted his gift of salvation by faith through Jesus, he is your God. He is your help forever. Let's pray. Yahweh, covenant God, our Father, we need your help. 
we need your help today, we need it tomorrow, we'll need it the day after that. We need your presence. We need your protection. We need your comfort. We need the safety that you and only you can offer. Help us look to you for it and nowhere else. And may you comfort us and provide the help and the assurance that we need. In Jesus' name.